So I would like to introduce the next speaker. A speaker. It's not uh, Hani Sechi who uh, can't make it today, but instead I can welcome Rahim Entesavi. Um, thank you very much for being here. And I think, yeah, you can start right away with your presentation. Perfect. My name is Rahim, and uh, I'm very pleased to, to present a recent work, an iClear exempted paper on the role of permutation invariance and linear remote connectivity of neural networks. This is a joint work with Hania Sedri, Olga Sao, Benham Neishapur. So before starting the talk, I'm, I would like to apologize if I'm not citing all the related works properly. So let me first uh, start with the motivation of this work. One of the applications of this work is to form an ensemble. And uh, one of the- Let me interrupt, I'm sorry. We can't see you. Maybe, I, I don't know if, if that's on purpose or- No, it's not. We see the purpose. slides, but I, we don't see your face. Oh, that just, that's me. Is it? Much better, thank oh, okay. you. Okay. So one of the applications is to form an ensemble. And as we may already know, that there are at least two ways to, to make an ensemble either through in beta space or either in output space. In this talk, we are interested in beta space because of some practical implications. Uh, so for example, if you want to make ensembles in output space, uh, we are uh, in this kind of research, we are interested in embedded, embedded machine learning, such as resource constraint devices, where we don't have, we don't have uh, enough space to store like three models in the right panel. So if we want to make ensembles in output space, we need to store all of them, run inference over all of them and do, let's say, a majority work, which is not a practical case in resource constraint devices. Hence, in the following slide, we are interested in weight space averaging. So to the best of our knowledge, there are at least two requirements to make uh, weight averaging for making ensembles. One of which is that we need models which are functional diverse solutions. Uh, because we want to look at the same problem from different viewpoints, simply. And the second requirement is that the solutions should reside in one basin. If not, then the, the average of such solutions will reside in high loss, which we are not interested in. So there are a couple of works um, in the literature that try to uh, solve either one of these requirements. The first work uh, is already introduced by Jonathan a couple of uh, hours ago is that on the right panel, you see that uh, we can start from two initializations independently and then train two networks. And we know that if we are training from two initializations, we end up in two different basins. So we first, okay, we have functional diverse solutions, but the problem is that as they already showed that they don't reside in one basin. So the weight averaging simply fails. They also have another related works. Jonathan showed that if we, uh, if we share some of the, tra some of the trajectory points, uh, like um, up to epoch k, then we can branch and copy two models with different SGD orders, we train them. And then that's good because we will be ending up in one basin, but the problem is that these solutions are not functionally diverse. Another related work in the stochastic weight averaging, which they start from one initialization, close to convergence, they save some of the checkpoints and then they will uh, meet the second requirement. They will end up in one basin, all of these checkpoints. But on the other hand, these checkpoints or these ultimate models are not functional diverse. So our research question was, is there any way to make two requirements at the same time to have functional diverse solutions, which are residing one basin at all, or not, because we are interested to making uh, ensembles by weight averaging. So in order to answer this question, we had a conjecture. So let's assume the right panel figure here. So we have four solutions already converged models, A, B, C, and D. Uh, Jonathan already showed that between each two pairs of these networks, there is a barrier. But our conjecture says that such barriers could vanish by uh, considering permutations. Here, for example, if uh, we say the conjecture says that there exist permutations, like uh, if we apply such a permutation, for example, to B, that will end up in B prime, 
which P prime and A are residing bound basin, so on and so forth for C prime and D prime. Then we have four models which reside in bound basin and they are functionally diverse because they are starting from different initialization. So in the first part of the, our paper, we would be having a look at observations over loss landscape shape. So the first phenomenon that we looked at is the effect of overparameterization, or simply saying bits here. So we fix the network in this slide to MLP one layer, and we change on the x-axis, we change the number of neurons in this one layer MLP from four neurons to 32K neurons. And the y-axis is the barrier size, as already stated by Jonathan. That's the barrier size in the middle point or supremum, uh, which we show that there is no difference between supremum and middle point. So the barrier size is the height of the barrier between these two points, these two endpoints. For example, if we have MNIST here, uh, the blue points here. So um, let's consider that to, we already trained two models, each of which has 128 neurons already converged to, let's say, zero loss. And then if we calculate the barrier size between these two randomly initialized train network, then the, the height of the barrier would be around 20%, right, 80%. What we can observe from the effect of bits is that the barrier size first goes up and then goes down, which reminds of a deep double descent effect. So we already observed deep double descent in loss, and now we see the, the, the same effect phenomena for the barrier. On the right, you can see the uh, traditional conventional deep double descent on the loss. On the left, that's for the barrier size. And if you look carefully, then you can match the points where the deep double descent uh, occurs on the loss landscape. So let's say on um, C400 to the power of seven is the critical point, and that's the same for barrier size. The barrier size is on, in error, training error. So that's the height of training uh, loss on escape. So let's uh, expand our experiments from MLP to shallow CNNs, which has only two CNN layers. Again, on the, uh, the x-axis, we have the bits, on the y, we have the barrier. Same phenomena is also happening here. The, the barrier size first goes up, and as we increase the bits, it goes down, like the double descent. Then we already experimented on different deep, deeper networks like VGG and ResNet. And we were surprised that the, the barrier is already saturated at high level. So no matter what the width is, the, the barrier size is already, already close to random chance. Then we were suspicious about the effect of depths. So let's have a look at the effect of depths. So here again, we start from an MLP. Uh, we have MLP uh, with one, two, four, and eight layers, each of which has 1,000 neurons in this slide. Again, on y-axis, we have the barrier size. And as you can see, if we increase the depth of an MLP, then the, the barrier size would increasing consistently. The same phenomena is happening for shallow CNNs and also saturating for BGG and ResNets. So we will be, so our suspicious was correct about the effect of depths. So that's why we are assuming that the depths, the effect of depths is much stronger than the effect of bits for the barrier size, the loss landscape shape or roughness with respect to bare things loss. The third phenomenon that we looked at is the effect of task complexity. So consider a pair of architecture and task. The higher the test error is, the higher the barrier size would be. So this, this scale for a moment, these points on the left upper side, and uh, you can see there is a highly positive correlation between shallow networks, in shallow networks between test error and barrier size. However, if we increase the depths for these dots here, which are corresponding to VGGs and ResNets, so deeper networks, then the effect of uh, depths is stronger than the effect of architecture and task, which leads to high barrier values for deeper networks. Okay, so uh, in, the in the second part of the talk, we are going to um, talk about the, the conjecture, recalling the conjecture. Let's say we have two models, M1 and M2, each of which already trained and converge, let's say to zero loss. And then our conjecture is saying that 
for each of these models, let's say M2, there is a permutation. If you apply such a permutation, then that would be M2 prime. And then there, with such a permutation, M2 prime and M1 are residing in bond basin, which means that they are linearly mod connected with respect to what Jonathan stated about linear mode connectivity. This means that the barrier size, the y-axis as I showed in the previous slide, that would be close to zero. And what do I mean by permutation? Here is a nice, easy visualizations of permutations on MLP, let's say. So when we talk about permutations, we are talking about permuting hidden layers, hidden neurons. Uh, here in MLP, N1 and N2 and N3 are permuted. And this also corresponds to output channels in CNN. So you can simply change the orders of the output channels or neurons in MLP. So before deep diving into the conjecture and showing some evidences to prove, I need two kind of definitions. The first definition is real world. Real world is the word that we got used to training. So here we have four models. Let's consider four initialization, which are black dots here. And each of these black dots are trained independent of each other. So that we, by the end of the training, we have four red dots, which are models at convergence. So this is what we got used to when we are training networks, right? Then the R model, in our model, we have only one network. So we have one initialization, we use SGD to train this initialization upon the convergence. Then we have one red circle here. And then using this one converged model, we apply random permutations to the hidden neurons or channels of such a model, right? So for example, if we have four neurons with MLP here, we have 24 uh, permutations. And then we choose three of them randomly so that we have by the end of this step, we have four models. Okay, this we call our model. So what is very important to understand is that our model satisfies the conjecture, right? Because we just applied some random permutation to the hidden neurons or output channels of a CNN, and we can permute back such explicitly permutation, explicit permutations. And then by permuting back, we have different models residing in one basin, which is exactly the same model, right? And we know that permutation doesn't change the function. In this special case, the permutations doesn't, not only doesn't change the function, but also will reverse the, uh, the, this red circle to the exact same model. We know that such a model, such our model satisfies the conjecture. And in the following slides, I'm going to show that real world and our model are similar or consistent to each other. If I'm able to show that, then we know that our model satisfies the conjecture. Hence, we are going to conclude that real world also satisfies the conjecture. Okay, let's look at how uh, some of the experiments. So the dashed lines you, you see for, for each of the points, you see a dashed line and, um, and a solid line. The solid line is the R model and the dashed lines are real world. Let's focus on MNIST again here. What does these two points mean here? So for our model, we have one network, which, which we see is 128. We already trained this network. And once we have such a model, then we apply random permutations to this network. We, can, we have 128 factorial permutations, and we randomly chose for this plot 10 of, out of this gigantic space, okay? And then after having these 10 models, which are random permutations of each other, then we simply calculate the barrier between each two pairs. That would be sum up to 45 pairs, right? And then we calculate the barrier between each two pairs that would be around 18%. Again, y-axis is the barrier size. What does dash line means? This means that we have 10 models already converged to, uh, already trained and converged. And then for each of these 10 models, which are independently trained, we calculate the barrier between each two pairs, which are corresponding to real world. 
There we observe that the, such a barrier is corresponding to real world, uh, the, uh, the error model barrier. So for both cases, the barrier size would be around 17 or 18% on the y-axis. And the same applies for all data sets, no matter what the leads is. Here we fix the architecture to MLP. The same applies for different architectures and also different depths. So you can see on shallow CNNs, on MLP, different widths and different depths. The barrier size between uh, real world and our model are consistent to each other, no matter what the widths or depths or architecture or data set is. So this is the first evidence to show that our model and real world on the roof of the barrier size as an oracle, as a proxy, are consistent to each other. However, the promise of the conjecture is to find such a permutations. Here we don't, we never talked about permutations, right? We just observed that if we apply random permutations to our model and no permutations to real world, then the barrier between them are consistent or very, very similar to each other, even the same. Now we want to find such permutations on real world. So we just grab the simulated analyzing as a simplistic solution to combinatorial, such a combinatorial search problem. And we simply search for such permutations. Before going to simulated analyzing, we tested brute force up to 10 neurons. And we saw that it, we could indeed find such permutations that if we apply, then that the, the barrier size would go to zero. Let's see how simulated analyzing is working. So for on the left, you can see the MLP and right is the shallow CNNs. The solid lines are corresponding to after permutations and the dashed lines are before permutations. So again, let's focus on MNIST. MNIST before permutations, you see the dashed lines are like here, first go up and then goes down as we have seen in previous slide. And if we use simulated analyzing, between each two pairs of, let's say, 10 models, then we could indeed find such permutations out of, let's say, 128 factorial. Of course, with simulated analyzing, we don't search brute force, but simulated analyzing could indeed find such permutations that if we apply for each of these pairs, for one of these pair, one of the models in each pair, then we can remove the barrier for MNIST. As we have seen in previous talks, MNIST is as Jonathan was uh, metaphorically talking about the sneezing to a napkin. So MNIST is, is very, very uh, easy data set. So simulated analyzing could indeed find such permutations. However, that wasn't the case for harder data set like SVHN, CFAR10, and CFAR100. Also, for, uh, for all of these data sets, simulated analyzing could indeed reduce the barrier size. And the same applies for shallow CNN. For MNIST is the, uh, the most successful case, which indeed uh, simulated analyzing could find permutations and we could make the barrier zero, no matter what the width is. And the same we did for different widths, depths, and architecture data sets. And as you can see, so here again, we have the consistency between real world and our model before and after permutations. So here um, you can see the consistency between dashed lines, which corresponds to real world and solid lines, which correspond to our model. So again, as they are similar to each other, we have seen that our model already satisfies the conjecture. Then we are going to conclude or at least show some evidences. This is the second evidence to support our conjecture. So that's a summary over all of these experiments, over 4,000 different networks, uh, over different reads, depths, architectures, data sets. And as you may see here, they are all corresponding to y equal to x line here, which means that uh, on the roof of the proxy of barrier size, there might be other uh, options to, to look for. But on the roof of the barrier size, we can see that real world and our model are corresponding to each other, which means that they are similarly, they are behaving similarly in terms of barrier. 
And we are going to conclude that real world and our model are um, behaving the same, or maybe they are similar to each other at least in terms of value. And we know that our model satisfies the conjecture, hence real world satisfies the conjecture. So some of the takeaways from uh, this short talk was, I just started from the forming ensembles to average uh, solutions. Our conjecture was to make different SGD solutions in one basin using permutations. And in this paper, we did some theoretical works plus extensive experiments over 4,000 networks. And we couldn't find a single case which shows or disproves the conjecture, but all of them were supporting our bold conjecture. Uh, I just want to note that we know that that's a very bold conjecture, but I'm very happy to show, to, to see related works like Berfins and also very recent works. And this year, ICML 2022, that shows that such a conjecture could even be proved. Thank you. That was indeed uh, much earlier than I expected, but I have many backup slides if there is any questions. Thank you very much for this very clear presentation. Um, shall we start with a question by the audience? Shall I read it out to you or you see it? Mm, yes, that would be good if you can read it out. Yeah, I can also see that, right? Yes. So okay. the first question is, uh, have you tried to use gradients of the loss with respect to neural output to find more quickly good permutation, right? That is indeed a good question. So simulated analyzing is the simplistic solution to find, to, to search in such a combinatorial search space. And we indeed used uh, some better heuristics, one of which is functional difference. I also noticed that there are more recent works like optimal transport, uh, transport uh, which uses um, the weights, at least the weights the combination of weights, we can use potentially the combination of weights, activations, ACNs to align these two sets of neurons. That's a neuron alignment problem. So there are indeed a lot of solutions out there, not only in machine learning, but also mathematics, which helps us to align such networks. One of which is functional difference, which uses uh, the combination of weights and ACNs to uh, align such networks. So if you mean gradients, we have Hessians here. So, and we showed that by using functional difference, the, the dashed lines here is the simulated analytic performance, which we already seen in previous slides. The functional difference is the solid lines. And we showed that by maybe better heuristics, we could indeed also increase, um, decrease the barrier for a couple of more persons. However, it's not zero yet. For uh, MNIST, it's always zero, no matter, again, that's very simplistic scenario, but for SVHN, it's still not zero. However, the flatter, the better, when we increase the width, we are going to a very flat regime. And we could indeed reduce the barrier for CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100. However, it's far from the zero case. So the second question is, how does relate to mode connectivity dropout, for example, around the train model for uncertainty quantification. I'm not sure if, what do you mean by uncertainty quantification, but if you mean uh, mode connectivity dropout, I just know uh, dropout is stability, if you mean like, uh, so I don't, I'm not sure if I got the question correctly. Can you elaborate more on this question by uncertainty quantification, please? Meanwhile, I can go to next questions. There are often more symmetries in neural networks, right? Uh, for instance, ReLU activations is homogeneous. Do you think these other symmetries are not important here? Of course they are. And we never said that th that's the only symmetry that we, uh, that we can consider in neural networks. That's one of the symmetries that, have that is addressed in our uh, work. And we just try to show that uh, removing such symmetries is possible by means of permutations. And uh, next question is by Alessandro, which says that given two models that are in two different basins, but they are functionally similar, would that similarity be observable in embedding space? Uh, I guess at least uh, there are a couple of ways to show that there are, um, what's the difference between two models in terms of functional diversity? 
there are lots of ways to do so. We can count the disagreement or predictions, for example, measures like CKA are also out there to show that they are functionally similar or functionally diverse, which is based on embedding the space. And uh, the rest of the question says that, for example, by applying a similarity metric such as yeah, CKA, right? So there are a couple of ways to show that uh, two solutions are functionally diverse or similar. Um, in our work, because we are interested in um, independently trained network, which are based on SGD, we are interested uh, in two solutions without any similarity. So we assume that two solutions are already initialized independently. We assume that they are the only requirements, the only assumptions that we had in this paper is that two solutions are initialized from the same distribution here in this case, Kaimin. And that's indeed a, a very big assumption. But uh, other than that, we don't assume that they are similar or far away from each other. And because they are initialized from different initialization, we assume that they are functional diverse. And we are going to show, and we already showed that we can remove such uh, barrier. And the next question from Max says that, have you tried brute force search for permutations? Right, as I just said uh, during the slide, right, up to 10 neurons with 10 factor, it was possible even on Google infrastructure, but uh, larger than 10 neurons, that was indeed very time consuming and not very environment friendly. We indeed uh, experimented over brute force up to 10 neurons for MLP and Amnesycus uh, or SVHN, if I'm not mistaken, and we could indeed find such permutations. And surprisingly, there wasn't more than one permutation over even eight or 10 neurons. There was only one. Wolfram, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, um, thanks for, for the very nice talk. I have uh, questions of, sort of there are these different neurons and then you, you think about permutations. But if you really um, sort of think of, of, of large networks that are potentially overparameterized, overparameterized in Burfin sense or in a teacher student setup, that would mean that, uh, that some neurons collapse or condense, uh, if that's the word uh, Shikin uh, used. Uh, and so did you, is there, did you see any, anything like this in your, in your setup that, um, uh, so within one solution, there are some duplicate neurons? No, actually we never noticed, uh, we never looked at such a phenomenon. That's indeed a nice uh, conjecture to show, but we never looked at this. But you, basically, correct me if I'm wrong, but what you just mentioned is that because we have so many parameters more than the number of samples, there are multiple neurons which does the same task, right? We, and that's indeed why we can use dropout probably, right? That's the intuition behind the dropout. So it makes sense intuitively for me that that might be the case, but we never looked at this phenomenon. That would also reduce the number of permutations you have to look for. Right. So recently we did some works because um, we, we, we had a lot of heuristics, functional difference, optimal transport, all of them fall short of showing real world is zero everywhere. And then we, um, assume that actually we were suspicious if this is really the case. So if conjecture is completely true. And we did some search over different hyperparameters like dropout, batch size, weight decay. And we recently found that dropout is one of the maybe most successful cases. So if you could use, so all of these networks that I just showed are without dropout, uh, without batch normalization, let's say dropout, all of these hyperparameters. And we recently observed that if you use dropout, at least for the case of MLP, CIFAR 10, SVHN, and MNIS, we could indeed get zero barrier everywhere. And that's probably because what you just mentioned. Thanks a lot. Are there any further questions?